we can start. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, hi everybody. I'm Kristen Grauman. I'm a professor at UT Austin and a researcher at Facebook AI Research. And uh, this workshop is about people, and my talk is about what people wear and how computer vision fits in to, you know, build and solve some new problems there. Okay. So. Again, fashion is really not just about shopping. It's not just about dressing to impress other people. It's really about people themselves. And we know that the clothing that we see people wearing over time is really a direct reflection of culture, of politics, of economics. And this makes it very interesting, you know, whether you're fully invested and on board with high fashion or not. Um, clothing is just about everyone and um, the way we get to what we wear has to do with what's happening in the world. For example, if you look over um, around the last century within the United States, you can see elements of style and fashion that are affected by world events, that are affected by economics. For example, a return to real simplicity in clothing after World War I, or um, people jumping on more inexpensive fabrics that were manufactured to make glamorous looks like you see here, then World War II, a return to more austere measures and simplicity in the clothing, to things that are affected by politics. So the rise of feminism and women wearing denim more and more, or the rise of the anti-war movement leading to the hippie style, or finally, increasing presence of women in the workplace, another um, cultural event that also spurred new developments in fashion, such as workplace clothes. Okay, so this makes it, I think, a very interesting area for us to be looking at. And there's also plenty of real world application too, once we can bring computer vision into the fashion domain. So right away, we can think of applications for businesses who want to be able to understand what people are buying, what they're preferring, and how that's changing over time. We can also think of ourselves as consumers, where we want to be able to have smart vision systems that help us pinpoint what we're shopping for because the content's understood, and even into new applications in design and creativity where um, the ability to understand this content would change even what people can dream about creating. Now on the flip side, fashion poses to us in computer vision some new challenges that as some of the results I'll show you today, force us to go beyond traditional recognition or reconstruction to handle things like very subtle distinctions so having methods that understand that these are two shoes that share a whole lot of features, but are also different in subtle but important ways. Two problems in composition or compatibility. Here we care not just about what looks related or the same, we care about what things go together. And this brings new challenges in vision. And finally, there's a lot of scope for bringing in personalization and taste into these computer vision models. So what's shared by all such challenges is this need to be able to represent visual style. And what I'm going to talk about in the remainder of our time today is some of our uh, recent and ongoing work to try to model style and in fact learn it directly from web photos. So this talk is about learning about clothing style from web photos. And there's two main challenges we're interested in. One is recommendation. Here we want to be able to answer questions like, if I have an outfit, what would be a small change that I could make to it to make it more fashionable? And secondly, I'm going to show you our new results on how to make recommendations for clothing where you take into account the shape of the body of the person who's going to wear it. Okay, so these are both about thinking about what clothes would go well together, how to make them fashionable, and how to choose things that are paying attention to the body that's going into those clothes. Um, the last part of the talk, then I'll shift from recommendation, which is really a personal, you know, individual level task, to the global stage. And we'll look at how we can pay attention to how styles are moving from city to city around the world in order to forecast the future styles that are going to be popular. Okay, so there's really three elements then along these two themes that I'm going to cover in this talk. And let's start with that first question. This is a question about editing an outfit. And we can take some inspiration for this project from these famous words from Coco Chanel, who said, before you leave the house, look in the mirror and take one thing off. 
Hey, this kind of advice really speaks to the importance of small changes having a big impact on the quality of a look. So here's what we're taking that inspiration to. Our idea is to be able to calculate the minimal edits that would improve an out outfit. So here I'm showing you three outfits in pairs where in each pair, the one on the right would be a minimally edited version of its um, partner on the left where it's increased in fashionability. So for example, on the left, the scarf came off or in the middle, the cut of the shirt is a little bit different or in the right hand side, the shirt's been tucked in. Now these are small changes that can have big impact on the perception of the look. And this is what we want to be able to optimize and suggest automatically learning from photos. Now, keep in mind, this is technically a hard problem because one, these changes are small. So little changes within the pixels are gonna make a dramatic difference. That's the whole premise. But also there's a question of how do you train something like this? You're not gonna find lying around pairs of data in which you have the same person in slightly different outfits and one is better than the other. So we'll have to be a little bit creative about how to train such a model. And finally, we wanna do this task while avoiding changing some orthogonal factors like the identity of the person or how much they weigh or what their hair color is. This needs to be precisely about the clothing that's on them. All right, so let me show you then um, what we envision this going towards and then I'll tell you about how we do it. So we call our approach Fashion Plus Plus because we wanna incrementally improve the fashionability for this person's outfit. So given a current outfit, there'll be an image as input. We're gonna create an image as output that is a bit better in fashionability. Furthermore, the algorithm will output a discrete suggestion about an item in an inventory that would achieve the look that's being proposed. So in other words, both show you what it could look like better and then suggest the item that would achieve the look. So let me tell you a bit about then how we do this. Our Fashion Plus Plus approach is an image generation pipeline. So there's two key components. What we've done is factorize the shape and the texture for these images. So on the left, you have the input image in the top, X, and there will be a texture encoding that is a conditional generative adversarial network conditioned on the shapes in a, a region map showing the different parts of the body. Okay, that's the black image towards the bottom right. And then the, we'll factor out the shape itself in terms of a variational autoencoder. So that will allow us to learn how to encode and decode into this um, region map that then affects how we paint on the improved textures. Okay, so there's an image on the left that's input, there's an image on the far right that's the output, and the key module then in the center, F++, is doing the work of editing the input codes for texture and shape to the output codes for texture and shape, such that we can then from them recon reconstruct the output image that has been altered in a way that it is more fashionable. So F++ then is a discriminative model for fashionability and we'll be making these incremental edits with an activation maximization approach by moving in small steps in the gradient towards the more fashionable direction. Now one element that, you, that I said was a challenge was how do you train a discriminative model to make these fine grain separations? And we have an idea here how to bootstrap images from the web in order to learn this fashionability. And the idea is that from the web, we'll have at our disposal positive instances of fashionable photos. So say so from um, websites like Chictopia or Polyvore, where people have posted photos of themselves with clothing that they like in some fashionable setting. And so those we can treat certainly as positive. And here I'm showing you, suppose there was just two body regions in that um, segmentation map, then these would have codes for both the texture and the shape, respectively, for this positive instance. Now, in order to train this discriminant model, we need negatives. And those we are going to generate by swapping in this embedding space, not in the image space, but in the Im embedding space, for um, the wrong coupling of another garment. So here, suppose there were only these two garments. In fact, there'll be more on a given person. What we'll do is take one off, so you know, remove the, sh the top part for this positive instance on the left and replace it with some other instance's uh, top. Okay, and that'll generate a negative. And in fact, we'll sample it from an instance that's rather far to 
increase the probability that this will make a less fashionable instance. So now you have pairs of data. In fact, you have positives and negatives for fashionable and less fashionable. And we can train that discriminative model to make those decisions from those latent encodings. So now finally, we can use that activation maximization technique to go back and tweak that latent code in the direction of fashionability. Furthermore, you can do this in the factored way. So we could choose to just adjust one body region. We could choose to just adjust texture or shape and so on. And I'll show you examples of doing that kind of targeted alteration. Okay, so that is the whole pipeline for Fashion++. Plus Plus. It's an image generation model. Image comes in, image comes out. The image that comes out should be a bit more fashionable without changing the entire outfit totally. So let me show you some um, example results first. This is a set of inputs, so five different outfits coming in. And then I'm going to animate it so we can see what Fashion++ Plus Plus suggests as the minimal edit that could make it better. So here we go. Here's the before, and here's the after. Before and after. Okay, so you see that there's different things changing. For example, in the second photo, they're going from white pants to slightly more cropped light blue pants. Or in the uh, third image, the top color was changing slightly. And as I mentioned earlier, not only can we say, well, here's the look that would um, be just a bit more fashionable, but we can also suggest the garments that would achieve the look. So in the background, you have a repository of photos, say a catalog of all the things that could be used. And we'll take the output of our algorithm, Fashion++, Plus Plus, and do visual search for the thing that will replace the garment that has been tweaked. And here are some examples of what's being pulled. For example, the jeans in the second photo that are light blue were proposed to improve the look in the top just above it. Here is another array of such samples. These are all the originals, and you can pick your favorite and look and watch it as it changes from its original to here, the Fashion++ Plus Plus improved to so original, improved. Okay, and you can see that these will be mild changes, things that can be not just about the texture or colors that are present, but even about the presentation, such as tucking in the shirt a little bit more or um, adjusting a hemline slightly in, in up or down. In fact, these shape changes, I think, are some of the most interesting outcomes from the method. Here I'm highlighting four, where the main change is not about the items of clothing, but really how they're worn. So these are the four originals. And then I'll animate, and we'll see the Fashion++ Plus Plus proposal, which is changing the fit of the pants on the left, in the second one, changing their length. And notice in the third and fourth, just requesting that the shirt be tucked in or bloused out more. Okay, so here you can think back to Coco Chanel's advice of looking in the mirror, making a, taking, making, you know, taking some accessory off. Here there's some small change that's been requested, and it really does change the look. All right, so I've been showing you lots of photos, examples of what it can do. Of course, it's also really important to evaluate it um, quantitatively. And to do this, we've looked at two different um, methodologies. So one is automatic, where we have the ground truth, which is an original fashionable photo. We created its negative in the way I described earlier, and then we asked the algorithm to fix the negative, make it more fashionable. So we actually know the ground truth as well as others like it that would be reasonable as more fashionable instances, and we can quantify then how much is our method or any baseline moving closer to that fashionable instance. Furthermore, and that's the vertical axis here, and then on the horizontal axis, we can measure how much did it change. So you can think about, you know, a model that really knows fashionability could always just return the most fashionable image it's ever seen, but that wouldn't count as a minimal edit. So we have to balance these two factors of the amount the fashion's improving and the amount things are changing. We want as much improvement as possible with as little change as possible. And so that's what you can see kind of playing out here with our method in the red for the automatic evaluation on the left. On the right, you'll see a very similar pattern where now, however, we're asking people to react to the suggestions our algorithm made and asking the same questions, like how much, how similar does the output look to the original? How much has the fashion minimability improved on some Likert scale? Okay, and the baselines here are things that either just optimize fashionability, just try to move as far in that direction as they can, or just optimize similarity, just try to find an outfit that looks similar. 
but need not be any more fashionable or just a random choice. And the short story from both of these is that Fashion Plus Plus can really balance these two factors, letting us improve fashionability but not changing the outfit too much. Okay, we did this work at Facebook and it received a little bit of press attention. That was fun. Um, here's one of our favorites that I'll play for you now. You're all now that Facebook has developed an AI program that can see people's outfits and photos and suggest changes that would make them more stylish. Uh, okay, great, but you first. <laughs> okay, so I hope that you could hear the sound through Zoom. All right, so this was about tweaking an outfit for fashionability. And now I want to transition from there into another element of recommendation that I think is rather underexplored, um, where we want to look at the body shape. Okay, so current methods would consider that one shape fits all, right? So the recommendation problem is a very hard one, and often it's thought more about you know, preferences and taste and style and previous purchases. But we all also know well that how much we like a piece of clothing has a lot to do with how it fits on our bodies. And our bodies are not all the same. And so this is exactly where we want to come in and think about clothing recommendation as a function of fit to an individual's body shape. We want to be able to recommend clothing that's sensitive to body shape, taking into account the reality that there are many, many different shapes and sizes, uh, and there's many different clothes. How do we find the right matchings between these? So when we think about this problem, we're aware quite quickly of a data problem. So there's a danger of body bias in existing data sets. For example, in deep fashion, a popular and very powerful, useful data set of people in clothing, um, you will find there is a skew in the body shapes. So these will tend to taller, thinner people of our population, not to mention you know, some other limitations and diversity. So this will hurt us if you know, we're learning from such data how to match clothes to the way they fit people if we don't have a diversity of body shapes there. So part of this work that I'm about to describe was to identify a data set that could allow us to have some distribution more representative um, of the diversity of body shapes that exist. Okay, so we're going to move you know, from the distribution that was fully on the taller and thinner side to something that's a bit more representative. And to get that, what we looked at was this uh, website catalog called Bird's Nest. And what's really cool about this source is that there are models shown wearing the clothing, and the models themselves have different body shapes. And this site will show you a given garment on a given model and indicate what size that model is. And so you'll have certain models wearing certain clothes, other models were wearing other clothes, and along with the clothing, you get measurements about that the person wearing them, as well as catalog images and attributes about them. So we took that data and we'll use it to form the repository from which we're going to train. And to do this, we want to look at which models wore which clothes. And we'll take this as a positive signal that those clothing items were flattering to those individual models. And that, that'll give us a, a positive instance between a clothing garment and that body shape. But we actually blur those labels a bit more because not every model wore everything, and yet two models might be quite similar in their body shape. So in other words, we cluster at the body shape level. So in order to form groups like I'm showing in my cartoon here, and then we can spread those garments as positive pairings among those other people within the same body cluster. Okay. So then the, we'll generate positives as saying which garments are flattering to which body shapes. And then we can also generate negatives because we can look at cross clusters to see garments that weren't worn by this body shape. And we'll infer from that that these are more negative contrasting pairs. Okay, so now we have a way to take implicit supervision, again from a web photo source, and use it to train a model um, that will allow us to do recommendation of respecting fit. And we call our approach here Visual Body Aware Embedding, or VIBE. And this is a multi-view embedding. It's an embedding where you can map in a piece of clothing or you can map in a body shape. And what we want 
to have this embedding, embedding achieve through training is that bodies that are flattered by a particular piece of clothing should be close to that clothing in the embedding space. That's objective one. And we want that um, also bodies that are similar in body shape should be close to other such bodies. So for this, on the input side, for clothing, we'll, we'll consider input that consists of attributes of the clothes, like the ones you see here, floral print, round neckline, etc. That'll be one part of the input in, um, that gets encoded. And the other part is a vanilla a CNN on the photo itself. On the body side, we do an extraction um, using off the shelf techniques in order to come up with a 3D body shape estimate. Here we're using a version of a simple model in order to get a, a compact representation of the 3D shape for this individual model in the photo. And we'll also, when available, use the measurements. Okay, so all of these inputs then from the clothing and the body come in, and then we learn this embedding that can embed clothing or body shapes in the way I described for those objectives. Okay, so now you have a space where, given a new garment, you can go in and map to the body shapes that it would flatter. Or giving an individual who's looking for recommendations, you can map their body shape as read out of a photo of that person into this space and find all the garments that would be flattering. Okay, so we've tested for just these things. Um, and we've done so with data sets of dresses. I'm showing results for those on the top and as well as tops, those are on the bottom on my slide. And we're comparing the recommendations we get from our approach, which is body aware, to a, a set of baselines. So CF means collaborative filtering. So this is a traditional, powerful recommendation approach. We implemented versions that would be body aware or body agnostic for that. And then we have an apples to apples as well embedding approach, just like Vibe, but one that is agnostic to body shape. And you can think of that one blue as being representative of what the state of the art would have been before when no accounting was done for body shape when making clothing recommendations. Okay, so we have ground truth then from that bird's nest data, and that's how we can get these AUC numbers that I'm showing here, higher is better. And you can see whether we consider the case that a person has been seen by our model or not, or garment has been seen or not, there's across the board an encouraging improvement with our approach. We also then took to a user study where we had people look at models like the one I'm showing you here on the left and indicate which would be a preferred garment for that person in terms of fit or to do the same question according to their own body shape. And then we were able to quantify how much these um, models are able to recommend the useful things. And here too, Vibe is showing some encouraging results. So what do the recommendations look like? Here I'll just show you a couple, two slides of examples. Here is a subject that comes in um, that is uh, more curvy and the recommendation for dresses to wear that are flattering are um, the ones you see on the top. And they have things like three quarter sleeves, V-necks, a drawn in waist um, that are flattering for this person and then the less recommended ones are on the bottom. Here's a second input person who's more petite and shorter. And this, this algorithm then is um, recommending the ones on the top that have waistlines that are higher, empire waist, that add some length, or ruffles um, and embroidery that add more texture and volume. Okay, so you can see that these are specific to the body shape. And keep in mind, this is instance level. So whatever body shape parameters come out for that photo will dictate what kind of recommendations get, met, get made. There's no discretization at test time. Okay, so so far I've talked about recommendation for clothing, and we were looking at how to make minimal edits to improve an outfit, and that was Fashion Plus Plus, and now I've just described Vibe, which is a way to model human body shape when deciding what clothes to recommend. In the last part of this talk, I'm going to turn from this individual level story of you know, what clothes are good for an individual or for a particular outfit, to now look at collections of outfits, and in particular, the worldwide trends of styles and how they're propagating over time. So here is the context. We know that fashion is an evolving phenomenon, and we know that um, influence patterns happen across the world, right? We're very connected, and Things that become popular in one place will travel to another place, and parts of it will travel and parts of it won't, so it's style specific. 
And if we were um, imagining that if we could capture quantitatively these patterns of influence, then we'd be able to answer some interesting questions. Things like, how much did the runway styles at Paris affect what people wore in US last summer? Or how long did it take for some style that became popular in Austin to make its way to New York City? Okay, so in particular, what we'd like to be able to do is ground our learning of fashion influence, meaning this pattern of propagation of style from one place to another, through a task of forecasting. Okay, so a forecasting task means I've seen some style and its relative level of popularity for some period of time, and I want to forecast into the future how popular it'll be next. Now the idea is that if we have one city influencing another, so in my example cartoon here, suppose we have New York influencing Berlin, if the model has discovered this relationship, it'll be better equipped to forecast the future of a style for Berlin by having known what happened with that style in the past for New York. Okay, so for example, imagine if you were the forecasting algorithm looking only at that green curve on the bottom for Berlin in its history, you might very well predict something like the red curve in the future, looking at its history alone. Whereas, if you're doing what we propose, where we also have a model of New York's influence on Berlin, then you can see that that would allow to shape that forecasted trend into uh, the future according to what happened previously in New York, okay, and get a better estimate as a result. Okay, so this is my cartoon, but this is exactly what we're after. Um, and I'll talk about how we can, first of all, detect influence, find it, which cities influence which, and then use it to improve our forecasting ability. So for a data source here, we're using an existing data set called GeoStyle that was created at Cornell. And it has these public Instagram photos from 44 different cities worldwide across three years, and there's about 7.7 .7 million total photos. Okay, so these give these photos give an on-the-ground glimpse of what people are wearing, right? These are moving away from some of the photos I showed you earlier that were more on fashion, fashionista kind of websites. These are people in everyday life in the photos that they share publicly so that we can see a measurement on the ground of what's popular where. And this makes it a really interesting data source. So once we look at that data, we can do some simple style discovery. So the way we do this is compute attributes visual attributes like v-neck, red, textured, plaid, silk, etc. And then do some basically clustering on top of those attributes. So a Gaussian mixture model to say, here are the different modes and distributions of these attributes that keep happening across different photos. And what I'm showing you here, each uh, group of five photos is one, uh, or instances from one such discovered style. Now, with those styles, now we're interested in computing the trend over time. So imagine now taking those, each of those styles from um, any city and then looking at its popularity over time. That would give you curves like I'm showing here. And then next we want to calculate influence. And for this, we use a metric called Granger causality. So what Granger causality says is if A is influencing B, then knowing the history of A will help us predict better the future of B. And here A's and B's are cities, right? So we can discover between any pair of cities whether or not there's a strong Granger causality score and at what time lag that, that influence is occurring. And so suppose I did this and there was influence between some of the pairs I'm showing here. Then what we do in order to ground our um, influence modeling in a forecasting task we'll be training a network to predict the future popularity of these styles where we don't push all cities against all other cities in this model for all styles, but instead find the styles that have between two cities an influential relationship and use the history trajectory for the influencer to better predict the future for the influency. So for example, connecting the ones that were found pairwise here in terms of the inputs for the network. Okay, so that will account for this influence in order to get better forecasting results. We also add a coherence loss that ties together the forecasts from different cities so that in the end the full predictions are coherent worldwide. Okay, so this is a forecasting model. Let me show you the results there. 
So again, if we're taking one of these styles at a time and then predicting their future popularity, we want to know how accurate is that. And we've studied it in a seasonal variety and a deseasonalized variety. So if, even if you take out effects like, oh, trends just go according to the weather in a place. Um, in both those cases, we can see an improvement in the accuracy of the forecast um, as shown by the, the blue numbers in the bottom of this chart for our method. Now, the competing methods are um, our own existing work, Fashion Forward, and the work from the Cornell group on, uh, with the GeoStyle data set. And so these are encouraging results to show that if we not only learn how styles are experiencing popularity or less popularity over time, but also model the fact that styles are migrating in time from one position in the world to another, we can have more accurate forecasts. Now, we were just as excited to see um, how good these forecasts are. We were just as excited to see what things are influencing which other things. And in this case, you know, which cities are exhibiting the most influencing relationships to other cities. So here I'm showing you some graphs between the European cities on the left, some Asian cities on the right, where the amount of arcs from one city to the, another emanating out of, from a given city shows the influence relationship and its direction. And so we're summing, summing these over all the styles to get an overall view of how much one city propagates its styles to another. Okay, so that's a, the big picture view. Now, if we zoom in and look at some examples, here I'm showing on the left Paris. And Paris has, is a multi-city influencer from our photo data. Right? These 7.7 .7 million photos told us that in these everyday people's clothing, there was a lot of outgoing influence from Paris to other cities, and only some incoming influence that was very strong from Milan. On the right, we have Beijing, and Beijing is, in this photo data, an influence receiver from a number of different places. So now if you think about the influence as um, something that comes in or out, so we have influencers and influencees, we can sort these world cities according to their degree of net influence. And by net, I mean we just look at the amount of influence out um, minus the amount of influence in in order to just sort these cities on one axis. And that's what I'm showing you here. On the left, you see some of the cities that are mostly influencing other cities. So the less, relatively less influence coming in, but lots of influence going out. You see Seoul, Buenos Aires, and New York are over here on the left along with others. And on the right, you see other cities that are mostly influenced by, by other places. Okay, and then um, here, towards the middle, we're seeing cities that have um, kind of like a focal point or hub relationship with the world in terms of lots of influence going out and lots of influence coming in. And these cities here in our data included London, Shanghai, Toronto, Seattle. Now finally, let us take these net influences between cities and just map them out visually here across the world. So, you know, take the cities for which there is data and now just paint that color on the countries where they're from in order to and do so on a heat map scale where red is the highest and blue is the lowest for the level of their net influence. And this just gives us a snapshot um, of what these photos are telling us about how fashions and styles are moving around in the world and how these redder places are ones that have exerted the most influence according to these photos and the bluer one the blue ones are those that have exerted less so this is you know an interesting place to start to visualize what the data says and again what we like about learning these patterns is that this is a very democratic in a sense way to get influence relationships right as opposed to you know what the high fashion experts are saying this is what the people in the world are wearing and what that says about uh, a record of how clothing styles are moving around. Okay, now that said, of course, there's caveats there in terms of, you know, the limits of our data, right? So the data we have is subject to certain sampling biases that any web photo repositories would be subject to, for example, availability of the cameras, of the internet access, and whether people are even uploading photos where they live. Um, so we'll be looking for ways to increase even more kind of how, how widespread the samples can be for such a project. All right, so I'm going to conclude here. I've been telling you about our work recently in visual style. In all cases, we're looking to use web photos as an inexpensive 
an interesting on the ground look at what people wear in order to solve tasks like recommendation um, and understand forecasting and influence. So the particular contributions I covered today were three things. One was fashion plus plus, minimal edits for better fashionability, body aware recommendations or vibe, and finally our, the one I just presented on style forecasting with global influence. And if you're interested in any of these, please check out the papers. This was work done with the people you see here, Kimberly Shaw and Ziad al -Hala. So I'm going to stop here and would be really glad to have any comments or questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so you have any questions, please submit a question in the QA button in the Zoom. Uh, at the meanwhile, I do have a few questions. Um, so, um, so in the Faction++ plus plus, um, generation model, I saw that you require some sort of segmentation mask as input, right? Um, so there are so many different types of um, grow, clothing. So like, um, do you have an idea of how many categories uh, you are segmenting out there? Yeah, so the body is divided into, I believe it was 18 different regions. Um, mm -hmm. And so it includes like outer layer, inner layer, um, uh, you know, hosiery, the bottom layer, so on. So the different parts of clothing and we're using a dense, um, a dense semantic segmentation uh, for clothing in order to get those regions. Mm -hmm. um, and in the second word, uh, you perform some uh, body shape clustering and then learn the representation using some magic learning or contrasted learning on top right. of these cluster results. So, but uh, where did you get the representation to do the clustering in the first place? Yeah, so the at that point, we're clustering body shapes. So we looked at the simple body shape model parameters. I believe there's like 80 of those. And as well as the measurements that were given, there's like the um, three or four body measurements, like the chest, the waist for the models that are on that website data. So then we clustered those with affinity propagation to come up with, it. I think it was on the order of five or eight clusters among all the models. I see. So it's, uh, it's the parameters. It's not the vision part you are clustering. You are clustering based on the its parameters. Yeah. So that clustering, remember, is to find, to just to set the training data, right? So we want to cluster on shape, not the clothing. Mm -hmm. So the clothing is irrelevant for that stage. We just want to know which models, meaning people, have roughly the same body shape so that we can spread, you know, the outfits that this model wore to say they're also compatible with this model because these two people have very similar body shape. So we just mm -hmm. if you don't do that, then you'd have a you know, much sparser set of positive instances to that's probably overly conservative about what one person would wear versus another person. Okay, very cool. And in the last work, so I wonder, have you think of like probably combining the first work and last work? Like uh, if you can forecast things and then you, ha you have an idea on uh, when and where people um, wear different kinds of clothing. So maybe you could, like given an image, you can generate it depending on when, in what time, and then where. And then you basically can have a demo that over time, then how how the clothing should change uh, on a single human. So have you yeah. think of related kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're not working on exactly that, but we have some ideas related. I mean, just like you said, kind of, there's like the context and the, the occasion or the, the geographic context that makes something a more or less appropriate, say, and you can learn this from such photos, um, as well as the, the time point. And you could be talking like time in months or time in decades, right, for um, understanding what, what is typical or atypical. And like you're suggesting to combine with recommendation, um, this could be something to look at, like saying, I mean, imagine fashion plus plus, but now in the context of conditioned on event, right? So yeah, here's the yeah. thing, is it good, you know, is it good? Absolutely, This we're, we're now making it more fashionable, but let's make it more appropriate or more fashionable conditioned on I'm going to a wedding or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be cool. Okay, that's all my question. Okay, um, great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the talk. Um, if you have any more questions, can uh, please email to Kristen. Thank you again. Sounds good, thanks.